الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد. بس تر بس بوبت إن شاء الله. So إن شاء الله today the topic today is التزكية or purification of the soul or purification of the heart. And this topic obviously it is a very big topic إن شاء الله. So we're just going to uh, kind of like introduce it uh, today and I believe even in another mosque in the area uh, tomorrow night we have another lecture uh, which is going to be uh, distinct from this lecture but building on the same topic of, uh, of a tezkiah. So let me begin by giving something of a technical definition of the word uh, of tezkiah, the nafs, purification of the soul. And this technical definition is the result of many scholars uh, defining it in different ways and trying to put together uh, the different aspects that they try to emphasize. The definition in and of itself, uh, the definition in and of itself is something that just by going through the definition, inshallah, we can get quite a few points from it. But uh, inshallah, we'll just give a few points and then, and then move on, inshallah. So it is a long definition. So it's more, you know, I know a lot of uh, students of him, they like, oh, definition means I have to memorize it. Don't try to memorize it, inshallah. But try to get the gist, inshallah. So purification of the soul is the process in which the healthy elements found in the soul are fostered and built upon and added to, while invading contaminants are removed or controlled such that the person worship, such that the person worships Allah properly, and fulfills his purpose in life, which can culminate in the op- ultimate expression of true ihsan. So, what this basically, what this uh, definition is saying, is that we as human beings, we are born uh, ala fitra. Right? We are we are born actually with a nature, which is uh, open to the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and not only open to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but yearning for the worship uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that nature, and then on top of that nature, we know that Allah has sent messenger, messengers and given lessons and so forth to basically fortify and strengthen the, the, the basic roots that we already had within us. But also at the same time though, at the same time we, may, we face many obstacles, and we face many enemies that are, tr- that, is tr- that are trying to come to our nafs and basically contaminate our nafs. So there is a struggle going on. And when, for example, a shaitan comes to us, a shaitan is, is, is trying to make sure that we are not purifying our souls. So it requires actually some strength and it requires some effort for us to stay along that path for which we're naturally created. And as we go through this process, as we go through this process, inshallah, the, the, the means of this process and the ultimate goals of this process is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become a true abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is our ultimate purpose. As you all know, وَمَا أَخَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَاءِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ So we're trying to achieve that goal, that purpose. And inshallah, in tomorrow's lecture, we'll talk more about the goal and the significance uh, of that goal, inshallah. So, uh, so this is basically the basic idea of what Tezkiyat and Nafs is all about. It's really talking about the main thing, the main thing that we as human beings need to be doing while we are living here. The main thing above anything else is the purification of our soul. Making ourselves becoming true servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trying to achieve the best that we can as being true servants of Allah. And as we know, the Prophet ﷺ has described to us the level of Ihsan being a Muslim, inshallah. Uh, we or one of your shaykhs can comment on that some other day, inshallah. <clears throat> now, this centrality, so basically what I'm saying is that this concept of purification of the soul, this should be central to every Muslim. Every Muslim should realize that this is what, what he should be uh, focusing on and what, uh, what basically uh, he should be thinking about and working towards. And, you know, in connection with that, 
kind of like a very sad process has taken place uh, in, in the Muslim Ummah where sometimes we don't realize that this concept of purification of the soul this was one of the main reasons for which the Prophet ﷺ was sent concept of purification of the soul was one of the main or you can say the main reason that the Prophet ﷺ was sent we have four different passages in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the messenger and describing the messenger, the, the roles that the messenger is fulfilling. And in all of these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the same, the same roles. So for example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضُلَالِ مُبِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed Allah has uh, bestowed a, be a blessing on the believers by sending a messenger from amongst themselves, a human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending us a human being, not an angel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending us an, a human being from among ourselves. And what does this human being do? Yatlu alayhim ayati. For number one, he is taking he is taking the verses that have been revealed to him through the angel Jibreel, and he's passing them on to us. So basically, being the conduit from which by which we receive the verses of the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not stop there. And unfortunately, you know, some people when they look at the Prophet and the Sunnah of the Prophet, they basically almost just stop there. Right? They don't give much weight to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Inshallah, those people are kind of extreme. Nobody here in this room uh, meets those kind of uh, description, inshallah. Beyond that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, uh, and he purifies them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So I'm going to go a little bit out of order here, like in one of the later verses. Uh, in addition to passing on, in addition to passing on the words of the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ was also given the responsibility of teaching the book and the hikmah. And the hikmah here, as Imam al-Shafi says, all the, all the scholars that they've known has agreed upon that hikmah here means the sunnah. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah inni utit al-kitab wa mithlahu ma'hu. I've been given the book and something similar to it with it. So the Prophet ﷺ, the revelation that he received was both the book and the sunnah. But what does it mean that he's teaching the book? Allah has already mentioned Allah has already mentioned that he's passing on to us the words of the Quran. But now he's teaching us the book. He's teaching us the meaning of the book. Allah gave him the knowledge of not just the words of the Quran, but also the meaning of the, of the book. Because the Quran, the Quran is left wal ma'na. It is wording and, and the meaning. Because anytime somebody makes a speech, and the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a meaning that is intended by it. Nobody just says words and, and, and doesn't have an, any intent behind the meaning. So the Prophet sallallahu is also conveying to us the meaning of the book. Not just the words of the book, but he's also has given the knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to convey to us the meaning of the book and also the sunnah. And he's purifying us. That was the main role of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to make sure that his Sahaba, and obviously the, everyone who has come after him will receive this message. Make sure that he has conveyed unto them the way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them to purify their souls. This was one of the main rules of the Prophet Unfortunately, when we, sometimes when we study the seerah, or even when we study Islam, many times when we study Islam, we study Islam like uh, it's, it's like laws do's and don'ts and it's very rare that we that we touch about uh, that we touch upon things that talk about purification that touch the heart and touch the soul I mean, i've seen many many books by the way written introductory books about islam books written for dawah and so forth and they basically emphasize as a muslim you have to pray five times a day you have to fast the month of ramadan but the internal qualities of purifying the soul sometimes are not never mentioned 
When yes, this is the this is the ultimate thing of what the message is all about. The iman, the purification of the heart, coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we'll talk about later, coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with uh uh قلب سليم, with, with a sound heart. Even before the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to, to Musa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Idhab ila Fir'aun, inna hu tara, faqul hal laka ila an tazakka. Go to Musa. Go to Musa. His sin has gone beyond all transgress about uh, 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 beyond all bounds. And say to him, Would you like to be purified? That was the message. Change your ways. Come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and purify yourself. This is the essence. All of the messengers were sent with the message of La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah, as many of the earlier scholars they talk about, you can break. The, the meaning of la ilaha or you can break tawheed into two categories tawheed al-almi which is about what we know and say and and and, and accept about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa tawheed al-amali how we implement that how we submit ourselves to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how we fulfill tawheed via tawheed al-uluhiya taking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our ilah and submitting to someone no uh, 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 submitting to no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all the messengers were sent, uh, were sent with this message of how to purify ourselves. So the key to purification is in the Quran Sunnah. And as I said, unfortunately, historically, some people, uh, to be frank, you know, this point seemed to have been, have lost on some. So anything, you know, anything that anybody presents to us, uh, presents to you or presents to me, whether it's me presenting to you, to you or whatever, and claims that this is, this is part of the process of purification. Right? You have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to do so many spiritual exercises to purify yourself. I mean, uh, nowadays, for example, we have Muslims, I've heard Muslims, for example, getting into transcendental meditation, getting into yoga, as spiritual exercises, that they'll benefit themselves spiritually. So if anyone is going to claim that this is, any action is something that is spiritually beneficial to you, it's going to purify your soul, purify your heart, with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because that's the only true type of purification there's going to be. Shirk is najis, right? Shirk is something impure, the only kind of pure of purifications that are going to be is with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if anyone claims like you do this action, you fast so many days, you make this dhikr so many times, you say this particular dhikr, if that is not found in the Quran and Sunnah, and there's nothing indicating it in the Quran and Sunnah, then that could not possibly be part of the means of purification of the soul. The Prophet sallallahu knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu was the best in speech and knew how to communicate. He was given the obligation of fulfilling the mission and passing on the message. And he was threatened that if he, if he, you know, if he tweaks anything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy him. All of those point to the fact that he conveyed the entire message. And this day I have completed your deen for you, your religion for you. And that includes all of the process, all of the process, all of the means, and all of the goals of purification of the soul. So anybody or anything that if anyone claims that this is uh, a way to purify yourself, you have to take that back to the Quran and Sunnah. And if you don't find anything indicating that, pointing that out, then you know that that is not a true and that is not a correct means of purification of the soul. Uh, uh, inshallah, so always with these kind of big topics, I have to kind of like choose what uh, subtopics to, to discuss. But uh, first of all, let me just remind all of us, inshallah, about the importance of purification for the soul for, for the individual. That each one of us, each one of us, has to take this topic very seriously. And there are verses in the Quran 
And there are verses in the Quran that come from uh, towards the end of the uh, of the Quran, which I'm sure many of you have memorized probably when uh, you know when you were young and your parents uh, tried to get you to memorize the Quran. Right? This is from like the earliest surahs that you've memorized. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, for example, "Qad aflaha man tazakka." Qad aflaha man tazakka. The one, the one who purifies himself, the one who purifies himself, basically he is the one who prospers. In Surah Al-Shams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by swearing وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمْرِ تَلَاهَا What's the point in the Arabic language? What's the point of swearing by something? When you say, Wallahi. When you swear by something, you are emphasizing the truth factor of what you're saying. This is what swearing is about. You are emphasizing the, that yes, this is absolutely true. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks nothing but the truth. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this uh, technique of language, where the truthful one is swearing that this is absolutely true, this is a, 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 a compound kind of thing which all of us need to like listen very closely when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing. So, uh, this beginning of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by a number of things, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even swears by the nafs, even our soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears uh, by the soul and the proportion and order given to it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again says, قَدْ أَفْلَهَا قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Again, like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said before, truly, truly he purifies it, he who purifies it succeeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he fails, who, the one who, who corrupts it, he fails. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very clear to us that in your life, in your life you have, everyone has a nafs. Either you are going to, uh, either you're going to take the steps to make sure that that nafs is healthy and sound from the perspective and under the guidance of the Quran Sunnah. Either you're going to purify it or you're not going to, you're not going to care about it. Right? Right? You're not going to take the steps to purify it. If you don't take this matter seriously, as I said, there is, for example, shaitan, and in this society, there's all sorts of different types of shaitan. That if you don't take, if you don't take the health of your nafs, if you don't take yourself, take ownership of your own tazkiyah, and just say, for example, you know, I'm not going to worry about it, whether my soul is purified or not, then basically you're going to allow yourself to, you're going to allow your nafs to be open to all types of attacks, all types of, 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 uh, of destruction or destructive forces. And in the end, you're going to be the one who's losing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we all know, all know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to benefit from, from our tazkiyah. Allah, Allah does not need us to purify our souls. We are the ones, we are the ones who, who need this purification. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran, وَمَنْ تَزَكَّ فَإِنَّمَا يَتَزَكَّ لِنَفْسِ وَإِلَى اللَّهِ الْمَصِيرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever purifies himself, purifies himself for his own benefit. And in the end, the destination is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically what that means is whether you, whether you purify yourself or not, you're going to die. You were born to die. Every human being was born to die. And so you're going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you prepared for that day or not, that doesn't matter. You are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so the one who has taken the steps, inshallah, to purify themselves, they are the ones who are actually benefiting themselves. And they are basically preparing themselves for when they return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, the, the, uh, the reality is that all of the things that we might try to amass 
in this world, they're not going to be, as we all know, they're not going to be as uh, much benefit on, on the Day of Judgment. We even have a famous expression in English, you know, you can't take it with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about that day, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَطَّلَّهَا بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ the day of judge, talking about the day of judgment, whereon neither wealth nor sons will avail, except him who comes to Allah with a clean, sound heart. If we have not purified our heart, purified our nafs, then basically when we, when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to be disastrous for us. And we're not going to be able to escape meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Alhamdulillah, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in so ways is merciful to us. And from the ways that, uh, from the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to us, as, uh, as uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu has told us in, in Hadith Qudsi, one of the ways that we get closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that is most beloved to him is by the obligatory, the deeds that Allah has obligat uh, made obligatory upon us. And the beautiful thing about these, uh, about these deeds, right, especially the core deeds like the, article, the, the arkan, what they call the pillars of Islam, is that these deeds are, these are not just acts of worship in and of themselves, but there are also acts of worship. There are also acts that should benefit us after we leave these acts. In other words, there are actually acts of worship that we should be doing as, uh, as a type of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they're not just something ritual that we go through. But they're actually something that is going to benefit us after we leave the act of worship. For example... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa aqim as salah, inna salata tanha al al fahsha wal mulk, wal adhikr Allahi akum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Establish the salat. Verily, the salat prevents someone or keeps someone from al fahsha wal mulk, from basically lewd acts and sinful deeds. So here, the, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the salat as preventing people from doing evil. Preventing people from doing harm. How could that be the case? How could that be the case unless the salat itself, the, the salat itself should have an effect on us. And when the Salat has that effect on us, then when we leave the Salat, we're not the same person as when we enter the Salat. But unfortunately, many times that's not the case. You know, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, one time he said that uh, yani the, the, the righteous people, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, Ibn al-Qayyim here, the righteous people, they have turned the mundane acts into acts of worship. And the masses, I guess he's talking about us, I don't know. <laughs> and the masses have turned the acts of worship into mundane acts. So what did he mean by that? You know, the, the righteous people who really understand the deen, they can do something like sleep. And that sleep for them is actually going to be an act of worship. Because they are sleeping with the intention that they are going to re-energize themselves and then go out and work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that sleep becomes like an act of ibadah for them. Other people just sleep, I'm tired, let me go sleep and that's it. They have no intention, they have no reason, they're just like, well, you know, my body is telling me to sleep, so they sleep. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> but you're missing an opportunity to recognize like what is, what is this sleep all about? Why are you getting that sleep? I want to get that sleep, so inshallah, I'll get up at Fajr time, I'll be awake, I'll be ready. I can pray, I can make my dhikr, I can go and do study the Quran and go do X, Y, Z. You know, help people out with this or that. And if I don't get my sleep, I will not be able to do that. However, 
so that so Ibn al Qayyim, however, also said that the masses have turned the 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 acts of worship into mundane acts. How many people, for example, go to salat? How many people go to salat? As I said, and for them, it's just like a routine. We're Muslims. Right? We're Muslims. We pray five times a day. This is what we do. So I go, uh, basically, I che- it's like, you know, employee checking in, I check in, I check out, and, and, and that's it. So it becomes just like custom. Just a, it's just a mundane act. Take the fast of Ramadan, for example. In the Muslim world, how important is the fast of Ramadan? How many people, they, perhaps they, they don't even pray, yet they fast Ramadan? They fast Ramadan because this is what we do, right? This is part of our culture, this is part of our, our way of life, and everybody gets into it. Of course, sometimes that has a very festive uh, atmosphere to it sometimes, but anyway. The point is they are not actually like taking it as an act of ibadah. They're not getting anything from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ladina aminu, kutiba alaykum as-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fasting was prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, in order for you to attain taqwa. And the Prophet sallallahu has warned us that some people, they get nothing from the fast except thirst and hunger. They get nothing from the prayer at night except sleeplessness. That's turning, that's turning the acts of worship into mundane customary acts where you're not getting anything out of it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually has made a, a acts obligatory upon us, especially these ritual acts of worship. And these are actually meant to benefit us. So it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, you have to do this. But as I said, at the same time, you have to do this, but this is going to be benefiting you. It's not a kind of punishment. It's not a kind of torture that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you to pray. It's not torture, it's not punishment. It's not just routine, it's not just exercise. But actually, you should be growing. You should be growing from that experience, spiritually growing from that experience of salah. You know, some people, uh, some people, they complain about salat, like, you know, I go to salat and I don't get uh, anything out of it. Right? I mean, if you look at the different verses in the Quran, you look at the different hadith about, uh, about the, uh, the salat, the, and the importance of the salat and the impact and so forth of the salat and how it's an act of purification and so forth. I mean, you, I think you have to first ask yourself, like, how much effort did you put into the salat when you say you don't get anything out of it? Like, I've been Muslim all my life. Someone might say, I've been Muslim all my life, 50 years. And you can ask them, okay, have you ever sat down and, and learned, like, what do these words in the Salat mean? A tahiyatu lillah. What does that mean? What do you mean you don't know what that means? You've been saying it your whole life and you don't know what it means? Well, then maybe, maybe you should not be surprised if, okay, you leave the Salat and it did not have a, much of an impact. al fatiha so basic and so deep in meaning. And maybe you've never spent the time to like really learn what Al-Fatiha is all about. So the, so the problem is not the Salat necessarily. And the problem perhaps is the person's attitude towards the Salat. Because I, will, I can assure you what Allah has said is true. In the Salat at al wal mukar that Salat prevents the one, the person from doing lewd and, and, and sinful acts, munkar. I can assure that that is true. So the problem is not, is not the Salat, but maybe what you're putting into the Salat. <clears throat> so for the individual, we can see plenty of texts. We can see plenty of texts which emphasize the importance of purification of the soul for the individual. And for the Muslim Ummah as well, we can also point to plenty of evidences from the Qur'an and Sunnah that purification of the soul is obviously of extreme importance for the, for the Ummah as a whole. You know, there's a lot of people who discuss 
Like, what's the problem with the ummah nowadays? And I'm just amazed sometimes when I read uh, some kind of some analysis and different books and so forth, the kinds of conclusions that people have come up with. Like, you know, we're not economically strong or we don't have enough, uh, we don't have like a European common union that we're trading with each, uh, each other and becoming stronger or military is weak and, and, and these kind of things. But if we're talking about our weakness as an ummah, and if we're talking about our defeat as an ummah, well, we can see in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear that, that victory and help and support, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ There is no support, there's no victory, or there's no help except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He is Al-Aziz. He is Al-Aziz. He's the one who has the power. If he wants to make the Muslim dominate uh, over uh, any other people, Allah has the power to do that. But unfortunately, if he wants to allow others to dominate the Muslims, Allah has the power to do that as well. But he's not just Aziz, but he's also Hakim. He's also the wise one. He's not, uh, he's not like, for example, us human beings, sometimes we act on emotions. We act based on prejudice, we act based on bias. But Allah, Allah's decree is based on His knowledge and His wisdom. And if we don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there for us, if we have lost that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the fact that we're not purifying ourselves so we're not coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then who do we expect? Who do you expect is going to come for our rescue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنْ يَنْصُرْكُمُ اللَّهِ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ وَإِنْ يَحْذُلْكُمْ فَمَنَ الَّذِي يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتْوَكَلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. But if He forsakes you, who is there after that, that can help you? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forsake Muslims? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow, allow Muslims to be defeated or weakened and so forth? Unless it's something coming from themselves. I mean, we see examples in, in, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu We see, for example, in, in the battle of Badr, we see the Muslims were a very small group. They did not have the military strength. They didn't have anything. I mean, uh, uh, any any uh, military anal uh, uh, analyst, if he would have looked at the Battle of Badr beforehand, he would probably said, you know, for sure, I'm, these pro these people are probably, probably going to be uh, uh, wiped away or something. And even Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions that as well. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "لَقَدْ نَسَلَكُمْ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّ." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah had helped you at Badr when you were a content, contemptible little force. So fear Allah, thus Allah may show you, you uh, may show Allah, thus, thus may you show your gratitude. If we compare, uh, so as I said, from a materialistic point of view, the Muslims should not have been successful at Badr. If we compare that situation, when we compare that situation, like what I mentioned in the khutbah earlier, when we compare that with respect to Uhud, what happened at Uhud? You know, at Uhud, they were much, much more well-equipped in numbers and so forth. And actually the fighting, as we know, the, the battle was, was going in their way. And that's when those archers that the Prophet ﷺ told them, don't move, no matter what you see, no matter what you see, don't move from your place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِتَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِهِ right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, Allah fulfilled His promise to you. By His permission, you're about to annihilate your enemy. Allah says, yes, when you were there and you were worthy of being helped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving you victory. 
hatta idha fashaltum wa tanazzaatum fil amr but then but then those archers among the archers some of them they said no we must obey the prophet sallallahu and the others disagreed and they and they basically uh, uh, they disputed with one another right? and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again describes it wa asaytum min ba'di ma araakum ma tuhibbun you disobeyed right? you disobeyed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after you saw that meaning the booty they're afraid they're going to lose out on the on the war booty after you saw that which you loved that's what caused you to disobey right? in your hearts in your hearts obviously there is still there is still room for purification there is still room for purification and thus allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as we'll talk about in, in another lecture ibtila trials right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring that out are we really here for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or are we here for other purposes? So Allah brought that out in this case. Allah let them see the war booty, the dunya that they were afraid they might lose out on. And as a result, they disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a sign that their souls had not been completely purified. There is still room for more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, مِنْ كُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدِ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْ كُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدِ الْآخِرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are, these are people around the Prophet sallallahu these are sahaba, these are not disbelievers, munafiqeen. But these are people who still, who still need some steps in their purification. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them through these trials, put them through these trials so that they will wake up. They will wake up and they'll purify themselves. Make them realize that yes, I still, I still had this disease. Allah says, some of you want the dunya, among you are those who want the dunya, and among you are those who want the hereafter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, makes it clear that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeking us to be from among those people who want, who want the hereafter. Not those people who are seeking this dunya. The ultimate goal, what are we seeking? مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرِ what do we really want? Do we really want this dunya? Even if we are, I mean, these are again around the Prophet, Sahaba around the Prophet. They are praying, they are fasting, they are doing all of these works, and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them, Min man yurid dunya. That still, still in their hearts, still in their hearts, they needed purification. But it shows us again that it's the lack of purification. It's when we distance ourselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the nasr and the victory and the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes more and more distant. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in, in, in another passage, قَدْ أَصَبْتُمْ مِثْلَيْهَا قُدْتُمْ أَنَّ هَذَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that uh, uh, what, when a single disaster smites you, although you smote your enemies with one twice as great, do you say, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically, uh, when they suffered this defeat, and they asked the question like, where does this come from? Why is this happening to us? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you actually ask this question? Where is this coming from? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ إِنْدِي أَنفُسِكُمْ قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ إِنْدِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى قُلِي شَيْنْ قَدِيرٌ it's not Allah's weakness. If us Muslims, for example, go out to fight and we defeat it, it's not because it's not because Allah could not have done something. At the end of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah has power, ability over everything. That's not the problem. But before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul huwa min indi anfusikum. It is coming, it is because of your own selves. You are, you are the ones who are responsible for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Omar Khattab, when he, would, uh, when he sent Sa'ad ibn Abu Qas out as a messenger, he gave him the same kind of... Uh, whenever the Prophet Sallallahu would send an army out, the Prophet Sallallahu the first advice that they would give to the, the, to the army is to have taqwa of Allah. Have taqwa of Allah. And taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
basically the concept of taqwa, you know, some, some people, they just take it in to, just to mean fear. Obviously, it, means, it actually means much more than that. Taqwa basically is to put some kind of barrier between you and some undesirable result. So if somebody is, t- obviously we don't want to end up in the hellfire. So we need to put some distance between us and the hellfire. And when you have that attitude, you're putting some distance between you and the, hereafter, and, and the hellfire, you're very careful about what you do. But taqwa should actually go much more beyond that. We also should, for us, an undesirable result. It should be the case that for us, especially if our souls are purified, for us an undesirable result is that we do anything that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is like the ultimate undesirable result for us, then taqwa for us means we're going to put a distance, put a barrier, put anything that we can between us and doing something that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's taqwa. So Umar al-Khattab, when he sent the letter to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, uh, uh, after, uh, after, of course, the, the, uh, the command to, to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and he told him that, you know, the only difference between us and the enemy is our lack of sins. Our lack of sins. Otherwise, militarily and otherwise, we're the same as them. I, I mean, we're weaker than them, is what he said. Once we start coming the same as them when it comes to sins, well then other sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are going to kick in. And if we are worse than them in sins, na'udhu billah, we know the obvious result of that. Now I just want to make inshallah one uh, final comment because I think uh, I've taken inshallah enough of your time inshallah. So when you when you you know when you talk about this uh, topic and especially when you tie it into our contemporary situation with respect to the ummah as a whole, when you tie it into like political uh, concepts, right? I mean, we're talking about reviving the ummah. What's wrong with the what's wrong with the ummah that the state the state that it is that it is in? Uh, again, as I mentioned in the khutbah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala used to make the Muslim ummah the strongest or the most dominant paradigm and now we are very weak how did we get from point x to point z how do we get to where we are now but when you when you talk about the importance here that we need to purify ourselves then people get this idea that basically uh, what you're saying is that if if everybody goes to the mosque and starts praying five times a day that somehow like miraculously everything's going to change And that's not what we're talking about. And if somebody thinks that's what purification of, of the soul is about, then they must understand the concept of purification of the soul. Because we're not just talking about we're not just talking about going to the mosque. We're talking about changing your aspirations, your goals, your purpose, and making that very clear and single, uh, singular and centered upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that happens, everything, everything changes for you. Like for example, if you, if you tell people like, oh, music is haram or this and that, and then they get like, oh, you mean nothing is fun in, in Islam? Well, actually the question is not nothing is fun in Islam. The question is like, what do you think is fun? I can assure you that there's a lot of things that people do out there. I mean, we all live among the kufar here. You know, they go, they go, for example, on the weekends and they, they get stoned and so forth. And, 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 uh, and they will say, that's fun, right? And then we look at it and we say, that's disgusting. Well, how stupid these people are. It's just, it's a matter of perception and what you consider importance. You can look at that and say, what they're doing is stupid. Well, the one who is looking at somebody else listening to music, for example, saying, this is fun, why we can't do this in the Sharia? They'll say, this is stupid what you're doing. If you ask me, this is stupid, where's the enjoyment in that? 
So there are some people who are going to get enjoyment and pleasure and we can bring plenty of evidence for the, from the Quran Sunnah. Allah bi dhikrillah tatma'in al-qulub. Real tranquility. Ya Bilal arhana bi salat Real tranquility. Real enjoyment. Real pleasure. When they are doing the things which are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are in a state of, of happiness and joy and contentment. But that's a kind of happiness and joy and contentment that anybody else can just be jealous of. Because that's the type of ha happiness and joy and contentment that is the hayat al tayyibah the good life that you can have in this life and when you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any other kind of good life is actually a fictitious, fictitious good life. And when you meet your end, you'll find out how fictitious it is. And when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll realize, really realize how fictitious it is. So we're talking about changing our whole way of looking at things. What we do with our money, what we do with our time, what we do with our energy. All of that changes when the person's soul becomes purified. Uh, so it is a topic, obviously, purification of the soul. It is a topic for every Muslim to take seriously. And once again, let me reiterate and stress that the solutions or, or the answers to all the questions related to purification of the soul, they're found in the Quran. So inshallah, I think on that note, inshallah, I will stop. I don't know if you, Sheikh, uh, if you want to have like, Short question answered, or that's enough. It's almost nine, almost nine o'clock. In some in some parts of the world, it's uh, like after midnight, right? <laughs> take some. Oh, you want me to take questions and answers? Okay, so let's start with the answers. Question. <laughs> inshallah, my bosses told me to take questions, so inshallah, we'll take some questions. Yes, go ahead, brother. Okay, like, like, uh, so number one, so you're saying that the, the act that we're trying to do is clearly something from the Quran Sunnah, right? right? And now you're just talking about the means that may help, let's say like an alarm clock. They didn't have alarm clocks before? Is this, or, or you mean something like, not drugs or anything like that? Right? <laughs> So number one, you should be seeking like those kind of things, how to self-discipline, how to control yourself. You should be looking first in the Quran. So. And then if something is, uh, is like something is new, especially like, as you said, like phones, and like a new technology, maybe that wasn't available at, at a certain time, then as long as that is not inconsistent with what the Quran and Sunnah is telling us, then, then it's okay. Yes, just a quick question for you. Uh, when you talk about Quran, so like, do you have any recommendations for any books that you can review on this specific topic? Mm -hmm. Is this a is this a trick question? <laughs> oh. So, do I have any books that I could recommend? Let me think. So, I actually I, I have uh, I have actually written a book uh, called Purification of the Soul, published many many years ago. Extremely difficult to find. Uh, one time on uh, on uh, an Amazon, somebody was selling a copy for over two thousand dollars. Some people thought that was me trying to sell my. <laughs> but no, it wasn't me. Uh, but uh, but uh, alhamdulillah, you know that uh, that book, uh, inshallah, is going to be republished in Malaysia next year, inshallah. So it will be available again, and it's just called Purification of the Soul. And if you know how to spell my name, you should be able to find it. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, there, I mean, there are some other books in particular, like some of the writings of uh, Ibn Qayyim have been translated into English, uh, Ibn Rajib as well. I mean, these are all also good, inshallah. 
But no, this was not a sponsored question or anything like that. Uh, this brother, that's Yamaha. Okay, so so the verse in the Quran, Kuntum Khairu Ummatin Ukhrija Linas. It's kind of interesting how, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, with all this due respect to, to you, but a lot of people also, when they recite this verse, they stop also at the same place that you did, right? Uh, the last, the, the next one is also very important, right? <laughs> uh, so, تَعْمِرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُفُ وَتَنْهَوْنَ وَتَنْهَوْنَ لَلْمُنْكَرُ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And you believe in Allah. So, uh, so the... The belief in Allah, obviously, I mean, when you talk about the process of purification of the soul, that is going to be key. And so, with uh, when that is there and strongly rooted, so we as Muslims, we don't believe in uh, like asceticism that you become pious by going off, let's say, like in living in a cave and 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 breaking off from society. This is uh, this is you know the the concept of mysticism and so forth. Uh, this existed a long time before the, the Prophet a long time before Islam. Uh, you have Jewish mysticism, you have Christian mysticism, and unfortunately, lots of Muslims also develop some of those practices as well. So, but for but what we see in the in the example of the Prophet that 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 the purified soul is 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 engaged with the people around them, which includes ordering good and eradicating. You cannot you cannot claim to be a purified soul if you're not engaging in, in, in ordering good and eradicating evil. And ordering good and eradicating evil, it's important to keep in mind that there's, there's, four, there's four components to it. And they are uh, uh, what you can describe as like mutually independent. Uh, everybody has the obligation, everybody has the obligation to order themselves to do good. And everybody has the obligation to order themselves to stay away from evil. Under certain circumstances, we also have, and you know, there's some like conditions behind it, uh, like when the Prophet said, "Man ra min kum munkirun fil yaghiru biyadhi, fain lam yistatir." The Prophet said that if you see a munkir, then you should change it with your hand, and if you're not able to, so with respect to others. We also have this obligation, but the obligation is of like different levels. That when other people are engaged in, in munkar, we, we should be stopping their munkar. And we should also be encouraging them to do good. So four things, ordering ourselves to do good and stay away from evil, and ordering others to do good and also to stay away from evil. When I say that they are mutually independent, some people get the idea that, okay, I'm, in, I'm involved in a munkar, so therefore I have no right to tell somebody else to stop a munkar. This is wrong. Yes, uh, and, and, and some of the evidence that they point for, for example, أَتَمُرُونَ النَّاسِ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَعُونَ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in, the, in the Quran, uh, talking about the Jews, do you order people to do to righteousness and, and you forget about yourself. Uh, the the mistake that they were doing is not the ordering to the righteousness, but but that they weren't taking care of themselves at the same time. So if somebody like is drinking khamar in front of you, and you say to yourself, well, I know that sometimes I drink khamar, so I'm not going to say anything. Now you've just compounded your uh, your error. You should at least tell them, no, this is wrong. You should even when you drink alcohol, you should tell yourself, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. Even if you end up doing it. And so therefore, also when you see somebody else doing it, you should also tell them that as well. And inshallah, the purified soul will, will be engaged in those kinds of activities. By the way, are, are your clocks trustworthy? Uh, and during the khutbah, I was, I was you know, at the, uh, at the back of the gym, you have that clock. And I was looking at that clock. And then like halfway through the khutbah, I was like, well, that clock could be completely wrong. <laughs> yes, yes. So, oh, I think so. How do we what? Sincerity. Okay, so ikhlas. 
you know ikhlas uh, you mean ikhlas by the way yeah. okay so uh, so ikhlas uh, actually one of the perhaps a better translation even of ikhlas is uh, is uh, is like is purity purity so why we say it's sincerity is if you are being sincere to allah so purity means you know it is only for allah and it's not tainted by anyone anything uh, any other goal other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so how do we achieve that so basically uh, the process of, of purification of the soul will, uh, I mean, obviously one of the main things that that's going to achieve is ikhlas in the individual. And if we go back to that hadith Qudsi, uh, where مَا تَقْرَبُ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ مَفْتُرَفْتُ عَلِيهِ The hadith Qudsi, which states that, you know, my servant does not draw closer to me by anything more beloved to me than what I have made obligatory upon him. So this is uh, this is a key, and then the and then uh, uh, and then the, the, the hadith quotes continues that we continue to draw closer with nawafilah uh, hatta hubba until Allah loves the, the individual, right? And that's a special kind of love, actually. But this is telling us to start with the obligatory things. And what and and if you ask most people, like, what are the obligatory deeds? They'll probably start, you know, they'll assume the shahada has already been done. <laughs> And they'll probably start with the salat. Sound good? But there's there's other obligatory deeds which are much bigger than that. The actions of the heart, knowing Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, having having the proper iman with respect to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ. Right. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Know that there's none worthy of worth, worship except Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we so the, these are actually big big obligations upon us to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that even just that process of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this can have a great impact on the individual. And this is why it is so dangerous, uh, if you ask me, and an unf- unfortunately some shiokh, they, they blow it off as a, like, these are just historical differences, they don't mean anything. You know, those people who, who, who reinterpret the different names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they basically don't really accept all the names and, and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, e- essentially what they are doing is they're blocking us from knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a sense is revealing uh, himself to us in the Quran Sunnah. In the sense of, it is only Allah who can tell us about himself. Right? Who he is and who his attributes are. And this is what he has done in the Quran Sunnah. Right? And then unfortunately some people come along and they say, well, you know, based on these principles that we develop, we're going to ignore this, we're going to ignore that. To the point that uh, I can show you a book of tafsir, you open it up to Surah Al-Fatiha, and essentially it'll say that uh, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is not Rahman. Doesn't have Allah doesn't have Rahma, and what Rahma means is that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala gives everyone what they deserve. Giving everyone what they deserve sounds a lot like justice to me. Doesn't sound like mercy. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the main reasons why most, a lot of people don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His names and attributes. And I don't know how you're going to purify yourself without knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Plain and simple. That was, uh, oh, the boss, the boss, the boss has spoken. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, He will be here. Yeah, any more questions? Thank you very much, Shaykh. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Thank you very much, Shaykh.